Okay. Our first lesson this morning is from Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and 19 to 29, and you'll find it in your Pew Bible on page 956. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love forgive, endures forever. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in us. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festive procession up to the forms of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. This is, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 48. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, 
he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day, Jesus was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find a way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Well, my friends, today is Palm Sunday, the day that Christians around the globe commemorate the first day of the last week of Jesus' life. Jesus is heading up to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. His disciples are told to fetch him a previously unwritten colt. Jesus then proceeds to ride this young donkey into town in the style of a conquering hero, with his disciples waving palm branches, creating an impromptu parade. This honoring of Jesus only intensified as people created a path for the colt by spreading their cloaks on the ground for Jesus to ride over. Can you imagine the scene? The streets are packed full of people. In the preparation for the Passover, the city of Jerusalem is filled with hundreds of thousands of people, all pilgrims who have traveled many miles in order to be there for this most important annual Jewish celebration. Imagine huge crowds of people, much like those who like travel to Times Square to watch the New Year's ball drop, or those who go to Kentucky to attend the Kentucky Derby. In this crowd that Jesus is riding through, the disciples begin shouting about the miracles that Jesus had done. And most astonishingly, they proclaim that Jesus was the Messiah, the King of Israel. The Messiah, as every Hebrew person knew, had been prophesied to free the Hebrew people. The Jewish people who were being oppressed long for freedom from their Roman overlords. The shouts that the Hebrew Messiah had arrived in Jerusalem would have created a huge stir. The buzz of the people spreading this astonishing news would have filled the air. It would have been the topic of every single conversation in the crowd. But as the disciples were shouting out in public that Jesus was the Messiah, not everyone would have thought that this was good news. In among the crowd of disciples that followed Jesus around during his ministry, there were some Pharisees. Those religious leaders doubted that Jesus was the Messiah. It's fair to assume that they believed that Jesus was a fake. The Pharisees were there among the crowd to spy on Jesus, to document everything that Jesus was saying. They were trying to entrap him with their theological questions, and they were planning on giving their damning testimony about Jesus' blasphemy to the religious courts so that Jesus could be silenced and stopped once and for all. Who were these Pharisees, you might wonder? Well, the Pharisees were the religious leaders who were especially concerned with the keeping of Jewish law. These were the pedantic folks who kept track of all of the picky details of religious rules, and they were sure to document your every single fault and point it out to you. It pointed out to you when something was not completely perfect or not done according to the book. For example, in the Gospels, it is the Pharisees who are most concerned about the disciples not ceremonially washing their hands before eating. It was the Pharisees who accused Jesus of breaking God's holy laws by compassionately healing people on the Sabbath. And it was the Pharisees who were particularly concerned with money, who tried to entrap Jesus with questions about paying taxes to Caesar. Jesus stymied and silenced the Pharisees by his enigmatic answer to give to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's. So it should be no surprise to us that the Pharisees, who witnessed the disciples calling Jesus their Messiah King, 
and who asked Jesus to rebuke his disciples for this act of blasphemy, this very serious sin of calling a human being God, every Jew in the crowd, and especially the Pharisees, knew what the punishment was for blasphemy. According to Leviticus chapter 4, people who said that they were God were supposed to be stoned to death. Now, stoning was a very ugly and brutal death. It involves people who knew you, looking you in the eye, and purposely throwing rocks at you to kill you. Stoning was a loud death, with the victim crying out in pain and typically begging for mercy from those friends and neighbors who were, as a group, slowly and methodically breaking your bones and killing you one rock at a time. As an observant Jew, Jesus also knew that stoning was the publish punishment for blasphemy. Thus, his response to the Pharisees demanding that Jesus rebuke his disciples for blasphemy is another enigmatic answer. Jesus says that if the disciples are silent, the stones themselves would cry out. Now, what does Jesus mean that stones would cry out? I know he was not referring to pop rocks. <laughs> Certainly, sound waves can echo off stones, and then our own cries would come back to us. Was Jesus talking about the echo of the disciples' shouts bouncing back to them off the walls of Jerusalem? That would indeed happen if the disciples just were silenced for a minute. Or did Jesus mean that if the disciples were silent, that creation itself would testify to his divinity if Humanity did not. We can easily see the glory of God when we look at the rocks that make up majestic mountains and hills. Even the rocks around the city of Jerusalem are beautiful. But is that what Jesus meant? I think that part of the answer is in the next section of scripture passage that we read today. Jesus begins to weep over the upcoming fate of the city of Jerusalem. He speaks again about stones, this time describing how the stones of the city and the holy Hebrew temple in it will be destroyed with not a single stone left stacked on another stone. Such a terrible scene would make any of us cry. Was Jesus on Palm Sunday describing the sounds of a city collapsing under the destruction of war? Are those the stones that will be crying out? The rumbling of stones crashing down, can you hear it? The sound of a city collapsing is a terrible and horrendous sound, and one that we unfortunately are watching too often on the news lately. This week, as the Russian forces have retreated from Sher Sheridan, Ukraine, we have video of that type of destruction. We can see the images of crushed buildings with rubble fallen in every direction. The streets of Chernihiv are blocked with destroyed cars, and the residents who are left in that place are starving. They are in dire need of food, water, and other aid. The Ukrainian landscape there looks much like the damage that happens after a bad tornado. But this destruction is not a natural disaster. The damage in Ukraine is purposeful damage caused by human missiles and fueled by human arrogance and human greed. This is the same sort of greed that was being demonstrated in the temple courts in our scripture today. We don't often talk about Jesus cleansing the temple on Palm Sunday. It makes us uncomfortable. We would rather bask in the glory and the power of the image of Jesus the King riding into Jerusalem. We would like to wave our own palm branches in our own parade. 
But Jesus turning over the tables of the money, money lenders in the Hebrew temple is a critical part of the story of Passion Week. You see, this action by Jesus is the final straw for the religious leaders. When Jesus challenges the way that the Pharisees receive their income, how they meet their budgets and pay their salaries, the greedy and arrogant Pharisees take it personally. They are determined to kill Jesus. Within a week of the day that Jesus overturned the money changers' tables in the outer court of the temple and called them thieves, within a week of Jesus grabbing a whip and chasing out their specially approved and expensive animals available to purchase for temple sacrifice, within a week, Jesus is dead. Arrested and tried and crucified on a Roman cross, the extent of the love and the care that Jesus showed for the least of these by speaking out for the people who were being cheated and oppressed by their religious leaders, that still resonates with us today. Today we end our Lenten exploration of the issues in Matthew 25. And we find ourselves also living in a time where there is an abundance of arrogance and greed. Arrogance and greed are here in the United States in our own machinations of systemic racism, our blindness to our white privilege, and our closing of our hearts to the underlying causes of systemic poverty that are among us. There is a great deal of work that needs to be done. As Christ's disciples today, we are called to care for the least of these who live next door to us. We are called to feed the hungry, give water and clothing to the needy. We are called to care for the sick and for those who are caught up in the criminal justice system and in the systems of racism and poverty. Doing so will not come without a cost. As Jesus demonstrated in the temple courts, standing up to the authorities is not popular. It may get you persecuted, reviled, and spat on. It may even get you killed. But standing up against evil systems is our holy calling. This is the message that Jesus proclaimed with his life and his love that he displayed for all of us in his life and in his death. So my friends, in conclusion, this Palm Sunday, we not only wave our palm branches in a celebratory parade remembering the triumphal entry of the King of Kings, this year, because of our commitment to Matthew 25, we will be carrying the weight of the poor and the oppressed on our hearts carrying it just like we would carry rocks up a big hill. We will be setting our eyes on our own Jerusalem and weeping for the least of these as we stand up and speak up for them in our own structures of power in our world. Our road is not easy. Those who have power do not like to be challenged at all. But we cannot change those structures of power alone. But with God's help, all things are possible. So be it. Amen. <laughs>